and the social and everything uh, that she does, which is fantastic. She has an incredible appreciation for aesthetics. She's the co-founder of Holistic Yoga and Meditation. She's been working with the chakra system for over 19 years. And Nina has a wisdom and serenity that captivates all the participants at her the green classes, workshops and retreats. And as a tantric teacher, Nina inspires women on the path of tantric spirituality, including tantric sexuality. And you guys wouldn't be interested in any of those workshops because there's no group sets, all right? So we'll just move on from that. <laughs> Nina spent extended periods of study in both India and Thailand and she, her passion is teaching the timeless message of tantric yoga and spirituality since 2005. And she believes that every life experience offers the gift of transformation and awakening if we can perceive it that way. So Nina's going to give you a presentation now, fairly concise presentation of the seven chakras. In my top ten new age, new, new age stupidities, in the top ten is that one, you should remove your chakras, and two, that you can remove those chakras. <laughs> that is in my top ten. I have uh, numerous other ones I could go on and rant about, but the chakras are there for your benefit, They're to help us awaken, They're to help us transform, and to help us harmonise our being. So I'll leave it there and we'll welcome Nina to the stage and she will take you to the gym. I thought maybe Anthony was going to just continue and take over my talk there for a moment. I'm <laughs> sure he would have liked to. So um, yeah, I will be sharing with you some of my knowledge from um, uh, my work in spirituality and uh, it is a really great passion of mine. So some of this ancient wisdom, what's so amazing is that it never really loses relevance. You know, it doesn't matter when it came from, it is as relevant for us today as it has been ever. And uh, just before I start, I just want to say one thing which is really cool for me, and that is that I am from the opposite side of the planet, which is Norway, so I never really get to share uh, what I do very much with my friends and family back home basically because it's usually upside down time-wise and everything but because we are live streaming I am expecting that my little family is sitting there in their pyjamas is having their morning cup of tea <laughs> watching this and if they're not they're in trouble so hello to my sister and the rest of the family and also the family in Sydney which is really wonderful that they can join us and um, so let's get into it so today we talk about um, evolution in so many different ways awakening uh, spiritual evolution um, whatever you want to call it it doesn't really matter if you sort of climb onto the top of the mountain you'll see that it's just different words for the same thing but what it implies is that we're all sort of saying that I am born or I am existing in a certain way in this moment but I have the possibility to change into something different would everybody agree with that so that's probably why most of the people are here because that's what we are interested in and we find it fascinating the possibilities of the human experience that it can be something greater. Now, that may be the most important ingredient in terms of having that state of that experience of evolution is self-knowledge or self-awareness. It means that we're turning the mirror back and looking at ourselves like the little monkey behind me and you're kind of going, okay, I can see myself in context. I can see what's happening in my life. So, oh, we have a clicker, don't we? So there's a beautiful analogy that uh, goes like this. So if you are carrying your little cup of coffee in the morning and someone comes and bumps you and you spill the coffee and I say, well, why did you spill the coffee? And you go, well, because you bumped me. And I go, no, that's not why you spilled coffee. You spilled coffee because that was in your cup. So if you had tea in your cup, you'll spill tea. And if you had champagne in your cup, you will be spilling champagne. So life bumps us. It always bumps us because that's what life does to us. And when it bumps us, whatever is inside our cup or inside our being is actually what's going to spill out. 
So there, it's a beautiful analogy because we have all been there because when life comes and bumps us, that's when all those subconscious patterns comes out. And hey, relationships, they are the best for it, hey? So that's why some people have called the relationships the ashrams of the 20th century because they tend to, you know, you fall in love and there's a beautiful prince coming riding on a white horse and then two months later there's a monster. <laughs> so you don't really know what's happened but it's like all the subconscious, all the beautiful facade kind of sort of tends to fall away, men or women, princes or princesses, becomes little monsters along the way. So the chakras gives us amazing knowledge. It gives us an amazing knowledge about seeing what's in our cup. It gives us a framework for evolution because the chakras are kind of like a cult word. Lots and lots and lots of things are being said about the chakras but we don't really know a lot about the depth of it and that's when we actually have to look deeply into the tradition because that's the one that actually gave us this knowledge in, in the first place. So they're not just energy centers, they actually go deep into our structure. They are who we are. The chakras, they rule your physical body, then they go in and rule kind of like your energy field, like your vital field, then they go into your emotional field, and they go into your mental sphere, and they always all go all the way into your spiritual being. So the chakras are simply what they are, and they did the conditioning of your chakras, because everybody has their your own unique unique energetic makeup that's why we're all different so when we look into the chakras deeply we'll see that they actually affect the way that we think they affect that the way that we feel they affect um, directly the health and vitality of the physical body and therefore our vibration and our spiritual evolution so here they are, the seven chakras that are placed in the human body. Now, Anthony mentioned this very, very briefly. There's a misconception these days, which is really interesting, which says that uh, the chakras are kind of trapping you and you should remove them because then uh, you can sort of free yourself for that level of vibration. As long as you have a physical body, you need your chakras because we don't live on food alone. We live on energy. We are energy beings and we need that energetic connection. So the chakras don't trap you, but you might allow yourself to be trapped in a certain level of vibration if you don't do what you need to do to raise your vibration. But this is exactly what this journey is all about, and it is actually a choice, and that's why this knowledge is going to be so good for you. So... Um, the chakras are obviously seven levels and you know what I find so interesting because I've been talking in these conferences before, there always seems to be a theme. There seems to be a theme that all the presenters pick up so they kind of some divine order that gives us some kind of theme because exactly this is something that was said earlier this morning. The universe has seven levels of vibration, seven chakras and there is an intrinsic combination. So we are energy <coughs> beings, the universe is an energy universe and we are living in this ocean of energy. There is no real separation. And the point in which we connect with those different seven levels of vibration is through the chakras. It's as simple as that. So the chakras is our doorway to the energy of the universe. And there is bountiless of energy in the universe. You know, in the same way as we have like a little bit of a, we have a manifestation of a sun in our being, which is our, the chakra that is related with fire. That's kind of tiny, tiny compared to the sun. It relates to the sun. In the same way, there's that much energy in the universe. It's kind of endless if we want it. But the Tibetans have this beautiful saying that says that ignorance is like a man dying of thirst by the shore of a lake. So it's a beautiful way of saying that unless we know what to do and unless we choose what to act, then we are basically starving in a very abundant universe. Just a little bit of technicality before we get into the juicy part of the psychology of the chakras. So this knowledge obviously is from this beautiful ancient knowledge of yoga and particularly tantric yoga. And uh, the word yoga itself means fusion. So that means fusion between me, the individual, the, the, mac the microcosm, and the macrocosm. That the human being is a miniature copy of the universe, that I am a little universe, and the universe is a big man. That's how it's often explained. We are in correspondence, and everything that is in the universe exists in the human being, and everything that exists in the human being actually exists in the universe. 
The word yoga means fusion and it's fusion between the microcosm and the macrocosm, between my individual being and the greater universe. And this works actually in the way that everything I think, everything I feel, everything that I do, everything that I say would be corresponding to one of these seven levels of vibration. There is nothing that you can do in this manifestation that we are living in that is outside of the chakras. It doesn't work that way. That is simply the resonance of the universe that we are living in. So it means that if you are open on any of these levels, it means that you freely receive energy on this level and that you can freely give energy on this level. So if your heart chakra is very open, you can feel love a lot. You feel love a lot and you're able to give love a lot. And also the other way around, if your root chakra is very open, you have a lot of physical vitality and you're kind of boosting with vitality and good health and so forth and I'll get into that when we talk about them individually. The very structure of the chakra, chakra itself means wheels and it means wheel because people that have are clairvoyant or they can actually see, they see it as a round structure. Now there's a lot of people that think that the chakra spins around, it doesn't really spin because it's a part of the nadis that we have, which is the energy channels that they talk about also as meridians in the, um, in the eastern um, um, health kind of um, acupuncture, sorry. And uh, it means that if you're an acupuncturist and the nadis are moving around all the time, it will be very tricky to find where you're going to put the needles, but the energy spins. The energy spins into the chakras, which is why it's perceived as actually spinning. It is placed outside the physical body, and when you do intensive spiritual practice, you will be able to feel them. It's, quite, it's really not that hard, it just means that you have to really feel it. Some people obviously have the ability quite naturally, um, and uh, they can feel them already. But it is quite possible to feel the chakras, not so much if we do yoga today very fast. The yogis probably did the yoga very, very slowly, and um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about what I did in that context later. So it's placed two, three centimeters outside the body, what we often refer to as the etheric body. They say that we, we have an energy channel that runs along the spine that is called Shushumna Nadi. Through there, there is a channel that runs through and attaches and the chakra sits in front of the body and attaches to the spine. So the seven chakras, the sixth first chakras, they have polarity, so they are like yin and yang, plus and minus, sun and moon. They both they can receive and they can emit. They have sort of two different qualities and the seventh chakra, which is on the crown, that doesn't have any polarity anymore and that will all make sense when we get into them individually. So I would just like to invite you to make this last, this next part of this presentation a little moment of introspection. So use all these kind of words, we kind of put them onto yourself because self-knowledge is so incredibly valuable. So I'm going to go through a lot of the psychological aspects of the chakras and it'll help you to piece together your own little energetic uh, picture and you can sort of see well that seems to apply to me, this seems to apply to me. So kind of to have this sort of self-knowledge we need a little bit of humbleness and we also need a little bit of a strength because we kind of sometimes have to be honest with ourselves. So let's get into it. Um, Can I have a clock? I don't have any timing here. Uh, so let's start with the root chakra. The root chakra is placed in the area of the perineum. Sorry, thank you. It's placed in the area of the perineum. And root chakra um, is um, related with the element of the earth, the earth element, so the densest of the elements. and. Um, it is the source of our vitality. So a lot of the Indian tradition uses symbology and it's very beautiful if you like spiritual art because all that beautiful symbology you can actually understand a lot from if you listen to it. So in the same way as a tree would actually bring the vital energy from the roots and pull it up in through the body, in the same way we as human beings we pull our vital energy from the root chakra. So the root chakra is absolutely essential for strong and vital health. 
So if our root chakra is weak, it affects everything in our body. It means that all the other chakras are more dim, it means that our aura is more dim, and it means that we're not glowing in the same way we could as when we have good vitality. It is a quite a simple part of the energy structure. So this is what the sort of classical symbols of chakras would look like. They sort of often have a very symbolic drawing and you can see that this is like a flower with four petals only. So four, you're also going to see that this number is increasing more and more. So because it only has four, it shows that it is quite simple. It's quite a simple part of the human psychology and it also has often in these drawings, most of them will have a little animal here. And the animal is actually referring to the quality of the psychology of that jet chakra. So here is an elephant. So what can we say about the elephant? Strong, heavy, earthy. Bit slow to get going, but once it gets going, it can go for a really long time. Yeah, so that's the psychology of the root chakra. Another aspect that's really interesting with this drawing in, in terms of what we're talking about here is see there's a channel going up through the middle. And then there's a little, there's some deities here. I won't go into in detail. And one of them is always sitting like this. So this channel in the middle is a reflection of Shushumna Nadi, this energy channel that runs in the spine. So some people talked about Kundalini awakening, and that's what their spiritual uh, practices often was actually about, trying to get the energy to rise through here. So this drawing is saying, yeah, this is Muladhara Chakra, all good, this is really great, but there is more keep going higher and you see it'll keep telling us to go higher all the way until there's nowhere further to go. What can we say about the Muladhara Chakra? The, the temperament is kind of a bit rigid, it is enduring, it is very very strong. So people with a strong Muladhara Chakra, they are, have some really positive qualities, they are really um, patient, uh, when I get uh, root, uh, sorry, earth signs, because it often refer refers also to astrology, when I get earth signs in my yoga class, I love it because they'll keep coming. Once they, they're a bit slow to get going, but once they're coming, they come every, every week. When you get air signs, they come for two weeks and then they go somewhere else. <laughs> That's me. So it's, um, it's really wonderful with the, the root because it's probably not a coincidence that some of the saints from the um, 20th century, they were actually earth signs because you need patience, endurance, you need strength, you need vitality to achieve anything. So they're the really positive aspects of Muladhara Chakra. Some of the more challenging aspects of Muladhara Chakra, they are related to the fact that it can be a bit rigid, it can be a bit heavy, it can be a bit engrossed in physical matter, as if it can't sort of go out of this world. So you're kind of having a massive big four-wheel drive just to drive <coughs> 10 minutes to Coles and back. So it's kind of like I have all of this, having a big house and put a big fat fence around it. And so sort of things like being kind of very greedy and wanting to grab can also be a part of Muladhara Chakra. And another aspect of it that's worth contemplating is something that's very relevant often to people that want to be in the world of spirituality. And that is that if you find that in your life aspects to do with um, the physical integration, as in having a good home, having enough money to pay your bills, having all these kind of things that makes life just sort of flow smoothly here on the planet, if that sort of just comes to you, it shows that your root chakra is somehow open on that level. If it doesn't, it shows that there's some something here that is not quite open. So those are aspects that are really worth keeping in mind. What else do we want to say about the root chakra? It's just a simple, uncomplicated raw energy and it's looking after some of our very basic instincts like shelter, food, eating. I think you get the point. But very, 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 very important because the next thing is that it also is actually the home of Kundalini Shakti. So the yogis will tell us that Kundalini Shakti is curled inside this, um, this root chakra. So some of the actually very advanced yogic practices that allows you to awaken Kundalini Shakti, they are related with working on the root chakra because it's like you are energizing it and you're like waking up the snake that's kind of lying within you and it is an energy that has a huge potential for spiritual evolution. Our next level which is the black sheep of the family because it is Svadhisthana Chakra and is placed just above the genitals so and you can imagine that it has to do with sexuality. So it is maybe the chakra that has been the most 
avoided in the spiritual practice. So if you actually were to think about all the things that I'm going to tell you that's related with this chakra, you'll see that all the people in the more sort of um, ascetic forms of spirituality on this planet, they have shied it. They've kind of gone away from it because they found it too complicated. However, being from the world of Tantra, we love all forms of energy and we think all forms of energy is divine and it has potential. So it is related with our instincts and emotions again, definitely the home of emotions and it is related with the energy of water. This is very significant. Why is that? Because we live on a planet which is how many percent water? 70? But how many percent water are the human beings? A little bit different numbers comes up 60 70 something like that um, and we live on a so we live on a water planet and we are water creatures basically it means that maybe as much as 80 percent of the consciousness of the people on this planet is actually related with this chakra and hang on a minute we've got five more to go we're only at the second level doesn't mean that's the only thing that people have it is means that that's their primary way of reference so it's still a very pretty simple place. It's got six petals or six rows. We can see it's getting a little bit more complex and we can see that this Shushumna Nadi is going right through, goes all the way up. Someone's telling you to keep looking for more further up later on. And the animal is a crocodile. It's actually not really meant to be a crocodile but that's kind of a bit simplified. It's a water creature and the crocodile in this context is seen as being a bit slippery. A little bit more sneaky. It's not kind of as simple and honest and straightforward as the elephant. You know, the crocodile can move on the water without you even seeing the ripples, and then maybe comes at you from the back. So it's a little bit more sneaky this one. What else can we say about Svadhisthana Chakra? So the Svadhisthana Chakra is obviously related with sexuality as it's placed in this area here which means that uh, sexuality and emotions all of this together can be a little bit messy in the human experience and we know that because it rules so much of our life sometimes the sexual drive and the, the emotional drive and you know you kind of wake up feeling really good get a shitty phone call and all the emotions go and suddenly life doesn't feel so good anymore and then in the afternoon you get good news and oh it's very good so it kind of makes you kind of really quite unstable. You can see how the water is very rocky. So this is this territory. The really big thing about this is that it is the crowd consciousness. Svadhisthana chakra represents the crowd consciousness. And the crowd consciousness is really very much like this. We have a, we have a saying in Scandinavia which is called the Yanta law. Has anyone heard of the Yanta's law? Nobody's into Scandinavian literature. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> so basically it is uh, the law, which um, I know you have an expression for it in Australia, but I can't quite remember what it is. But it just means that the crowds keep pulling each other out down. You know, they keep pulling each other, just like water. So there's no peaks in water. And you know, the masses, the kind of leaders of this world, they know that. So we keep controlling each other. I'm on Facebook and suddenly there's some very important topic in the world and I have to change my profile picture like everybody else. <laughs> so it feels very good. Why does it feel so good? Because I'm with the others. I'm with the others. Everybody else has got a big four-wheel drive. I only drive it just down to Coles and back again. I'll never even put on that four-wheel drive and I'm spending five times as much petrol and three times as much in insurance and loans and whatever and it but still feels good. Why does it feel good? Because everybody else has the same. So the Svadhisthana person feels really, really good fitting in with the others. It doesn't like standing out. And so, you know, fashion and all these kind of things, very much related. Now, I don't mean just fashion in clothes. It can be fashion in your home or anything like that. Social kind of mimicry, kind of like eating with the right fork and the right plate and it's kind of showing everybody that I know how it's done. Very much a world of Svadhisthana chakra. So the leaders of this world, they know this. So they can use the masses to control each other and they can also very easily control the masses in this way because people don't like to stick out. So this is the consciousness of the sheeple. 
So everybody's familiar with the sheeple, and the sheep, they all do the same. Like, they kind of go the same, and everybody kind of gets stuck in the mud, but they just kind of get go walking through the stuck in the mud. So everybody drives through the, you know, fast food on the way home, and I know it's bad for me, and I know I shouldn't be eating this, I'm going to feel shit afterwards, but still I do it. Why do I do it? Because everybody else does it, so it must be okay. So on Sunshine Coast, every time they open a fast food, uh, sort of, new sort of fast food uh, uh, restaurant, they always sort of, and it seems to be kind of pretty much adjacent to it. There's like a chemi chemist warehouse or something. <laughs> There's kind of interesting correlation. So even we kind of have this drive, but people just simply don't know why they do it, but they just keep kind of floating in the same current. So as you can realize that this is a place that we can feel very much trapped. We can feel very much trapped, and it's definitely a place that we need to work to get out of, which means that it takes us to the next level, which is, by the way, I want to go quickly back because I just want to say that on the positive aspect, you have beautiful integrated sexuality, sensuality, very important for men and women to have a beautiful experience of life. You have creativity, you have, you know, um, charisma, lots of beautiful aspects also on Svadhisthana Chakra. Taste is related to Svadhisthana Chakra, so making beautiful food, enjoying beautiful food, very important on this level. More challenging aspects are addiction, it is like the heaviness of the crowd consciousness, the fear of being alone and so forth. So both good and bad sides. The next one is the fire element and it's called Manipura Chakra. Manipura Chakra refers to like the dazzling element of fire. So fire is already shining and dazzling and had this amazing quality. Now if Svadhisthana Chakra was the consciousness of the crowds, then Manipura Chakra is the consciousness of the leaders in this world. So if maybe the previous one was 75, 80%, maybe this is about 5%. A little bit more, kind of even. So sometimes when we look at leaders of this world, it's really hard to understand why they would do certain things, right? You kind of, how can they act in that way? Well, you, you can't work it out because your brain doesn't work in the same way if you are at the level of Svadhisthana Chakra, or if you're higher, it doesn't quite work in that way either. So Manipura Chakra dazzles the crowd consciousness because it's like deep inside, they would love to be a little bit more like that. They would love to stand on their own. When you talk to someone on Manipura Chakra, you're kind of talking to a real person and they're kind of up front. That is why the animal of Manipura Chakra is a ram. It's like head on, it's like tell me how it is and they go, you see how they go straight into each other. Like there's no, no stuffing around, no little crocodile attacking you from behind in like muddy waters. I'm just telling you exactly how it is like the ram. So the beautiful aspects of Manipura Chakra you know, even if we can have more of this energy, it's very, very, very important. So if you were to say, what do I have to do to get more fire? Well, you could do martial arts. A lot of Asian countries have more fire. You can tell that sometimes when you travel to Asia, I can certainly tell because from Northern Europe, we have a lot of, you know, different, very different energy. When I started traveling to Southeast Asia, you can feel that the people have a very different energy. They have much more fire more fire generally in their structure. Today I think we're all getting a little bit more equal, all of us, because it's becoming more and more of a mass culture, but certainly traditionally the Asian countries were very fiery. So they are very, they are the leaders of the pack and the Swadhisthana people are the ones that follow. So positive aspects are willpower, self-confidence, courage, you know, the ability to say, oh, are you guys going that way? Well, I'm going this way, because I feel like going this way. And not scared any longer of doing your own thing. Very, very important. On the other side, when Manipura Chakra is not so harmonious, the challenging aspect is being extremely self-centered, is aggression, is anger, is frustration, and so forth. So all the different aspects when people go to self-development workshop are being more dynamic, getting the job done, complete your task and all these kind of things with willpower, they're all like trying to grab people and be more in Manipura Chakra. So it's like grab them up and get more fire. So you know, we've talked about Svadhisthana Chakra, addiction on Svadhisthana Chakra. So if you have an addiction, so people stop smoking, and what do they do? Eat chocolate. More Svadhisthana Chakra. 
So it's like you're on the same level, but if you wanted to stop smoking and you started doing martial arts, you have a much greater chance of actually succeeding because you'll have more fire. You'll be more dynamic and you'll have much more willpower. So even if we can raise the majority of the consciousness into this level, it will be amazing. Because at the level of Svadhisthana Chakra, people don't have the ability to see the amazing structures that are being uh, manipulation that are happening above us because it's kind of happening at the level above your vibration. So very important. Now you might say, oh this sounds a little bit negative. Well the three first chakras, the Muladhara, Svadhisthana, Manipura, they have big sort of differences between the challenging and the positive aspects. So they kind of have challenging aspects that we really need to address in our personality and they also have very positive aspects that we absolutely need in our personality. So this, uh, this is very important to remember but from the heart of the minus it's kind of emitting and receiving but we can't really say that the heart has any particularly negative aspects of such. So very important. Um, the next one is called Anahata Chakra. Anahata means unstruck. I forgot to let you know that Manipura Chakra is placed just below the navel, so a couple of finger breaths just below the navel in this area here. Anahata Chakra placed in the center of the chest in this area here. It's sort of right in between the nipples, and except for some of us women it's just a little bit higher. Depends what gravity has done to us. <laughs> so it's right in this area here. And it is uh, referring to the indestructible aspect of the heart, or of the soul, actually. Now, it's a beautiful part of this um, uh, wisdom as well of the heart, is that the traditional symbol, it is actually, uh, you can sort of see it in the background here. Can you see it? What's a six-pointed star made up of? Two triangles? Doing what? Pointing up and down, yeah. So in the yogic tradition, that's telling us that it's like a union between the upper and the lower part of our being. So we have three chakras below and three above, and they're coming together in the heart, sort of radiating into your entire life, kind of bringing into synergy and harmony your upper and the lower energies of your being. So Anahata chakra, a very beautiful place. Heart chakra, obviously related with love, not really the romantic love that we often refer to as love, but the unconditional love, the love and where you kind of <coughs> love everybody like the sun loves humanity. It shines on everybody, on the thief, on your best friend, on anybody. It's like a love that just sees you in a different light. It sees you in your completion and so forth. So everybody really aspires to be loved and to love. There are very few people that wouldn't aspire to this because it is a place in which we can sort of feel that we are fully accepted. So these are the aspects of the Anahata Chakra that are so beautiful. They are the aspects of um, self-acceptance, of um, self-love, which is maybe the most important part at all because the ability to, to accept and love ourselves is actually what gives us the ability to accept and love others. So it really, really starts with ourselves, And this can be really confronting because if we are hard on others, most likely we are very hard on ourselves. So because remember this first drawing where the sort of light shines through us, it's kind of that, um, that's actually what gives us the ability to keep shining that light on. So when any level is open, we can shine it on. So self-love, self-acceptance, gentleness, kindness, first of all starting with ourselves. Because once we carry that energy within us, it naturally just radiates and becomes a part of our life. Now sometimes when we talk about love, we kind of get a bit muffled up because we're kind of attracted to someone, maybe um, we kind of make a kind of complete um, mixed bag of emotions that we call love. So in there, there might be fear of being alone, wanting to have children, needing someone to share a mortgage with. There's all kind of, you know, wanting to be sort of socially, I don't know, acceptable, not want to be some tragic single person if you have that image of yourself, whatever it is. But kind of this kind of love is like you strip all of that away. And then you see all of that, what are you left with? You know, I have a friend and she's in her 60s now. 
turning 60 and uh, she's a really beautiful woman and she's done very intensive yoga for many years and she said this thing to me which was really beautiful and I thought it was a really beautiful example of where she was at in her life because she's been single for many many years after being divorced she lives on her own you know she used to have a cat but it died and then she um, uh, she said to me you know I'm really ready to meet a man now I own my place there's no issues there, like I have my little flat in Brisbane, I'm, I feel in a really good place, I don't want to have children, I'm too old to have children, so even if he wanted to have children, that's never going to be an issue, but I just feel in a place where I just want to meet someone to, to share my heart with, and it's a really good place to be, isn't it? So you know, that's kind of the place in which we come from when it comes to unconditional love, it's like a love where you simply want to share your heart and your soul with another person, and that is the level of Anahata Chakra. We should that Chakra the fifth chakra placed just above the hollow of the neck in this area here. Vishuddha means um, extremely pure or especially pure and this level of human is kind of, it likes to be very 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 pure. It doesn't like anything that is not pure. It's kind of an aspect of the human being that's not very accessible for us human humanity today. So really it doesn't like gossips, it doesn't like smoky pubs, we don't really have them anymore but something like that. It doesn't like anything that and then we feel a little bit under the weather and when we're not kind of in sync with ourselves, where do we feel it? <laughs> quickly in the throat. So Vishuddha Chakra is a very beautiful place, it's related with time and space and the ability to kind of step beyond time and space as a continuous line and seeing the true nature of reality. You can see that we've already gone to 16 spokes, I don't know if you counted Anahata, but it actually had 12. So it is already a very, very beautiful and pure place. It is related with our, it is our source of intuition. So the source of intuition, can you imagine that if we don't have a pure mind, if we don't have a pure soul, then it's very hard to listen to our intuition because if our, if our consciousness is clouded with fear, if it is clouded with, um, um, with anger, then we can't really listen to that beautiful, very subtle voice which we often call intuition. It is very elevated, it's related with kind of a very sublime form of creativity so maybe the eternal quality of a cathedral when you walk in and you feel a bit awestruck in this way um, a Vishuddha person if you were to kind of paint the picture they wouldn't listen to uh, black metal they would maybe listen to a little bit of classical music and have a cup of peppermint tea and go to an art exhibition in the afternoon <laughs> so something very delicate very refined about this level of consciousness Ajna. Ajna means control, sometimes referred to as a mental control center. It is often referred to as the third eye and it is in the center of the forehead. So not where the Indian ladies put the little dot, that's a little lower, but it's kind of right up in the forehead. If you feel it, you'll feel a little dent here and you'll feel that's your third eye. So when it's referred to as the third eye, it doesn't mean that if you did lots of yoga practices in this area that uh, you'll crack open and get an eye here. It means that you are seeing with the mind's eye. So it's related with clairvoyance, it's related with all these kind of really extraordinary mental powers. Now it looks like we've gone backward in complexity because suddenly we only have two petals. It's actually because we have gone beyond the physical elements. So the physical elements are finished. We usually talk about five physical elements in yoga. In the previous one with Shuddha Chakra, we call it ether. And ether is actually that black stuff that you see in between the stars that are called uh, void in in science. But here we are beyond the elements. If you were to give it anything, we're going to call it mine. So we often it's referring to just two petals, it's drawn out of simplicity like this because it's like the ultimate polarity, it's just plus and minus. It doesn't really have much of a personality in the polarity, it's just that it is kind of yin and yang in its purest form. The person that has a lot of Ajna Chakra doesn't walk around this planet much today because it's a really elevated level of the human experience or the human potential. It is uh, often depicted like this, which is called Arda Anashwara Shiva, and it is actually the yin and the yang depicted as half man, half woman. So it's not really a transgender kind of thing. It is actually referring to the yin and the yang, or the plus and the minus. So someone with a big Ajna Chakra has an enormously sharp 
and clear mind. It's like the mind of the Zen Buddhist. So here is a really, really important point. Sometimes people come when we, I teach yoga and they say, I can't work on my Ajna Chakra because I'm so much in my mind. And my mind is already really busy. I, I need the lower chakras. I need to ground me. Hang on a minute. Remember that each of these chakras, they have a mind on their own. This is very, very important. So each of the chakra has a mental activity on their own. A fluctuating, chaotic mind, that's the mind of the lower chakra. The mind of Ajna chakra, that's the mind of a Zen Buddhist. That's the mind of a very, very sharp, very, very clear. An expansive mind, like Leonardo da Vinci, or, or a scientist, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, I don't know, if you go and look him up, he, kind of, kind of, he was like a scientist, a sculptor, an artist, an architect, an inventor. His mind was just extraordinary, and he's been kind of an, he's still influencing all of these sciences even today. Sahasrara, the seven chakra, we're almost at the end. It's called, uh, it actually uh, means um, thousand petals or thousand fold. It is, as we mentioned before, it's beyond the polarity, the plus and the minus. It's kind of coming together in a complete unity. And um, it is connected to the unmanifested. And they say that it has thousand spokes. I don't know who counted, but I think a lot of these things are more intuitive. It's not really constructed like the other chakras, which are more like discs. This one covers the top of the head, like you saw in the previous drawing, and also like you can see on this statue here, which is symbolized. Now, all different spiritual forms of practice, they have actually references to this point, whether if this is the halo in Christianity, if it is this little hat of the Buddhist, or if it is the monks that like, used to shave the top of the head. Very funky haircut, by the way. So they used to shave it on the top of the head, so they would have like a clear uh, aspect. Even the crown of the king usually actually be a reference to an uh, enlightened master. It goes on in, in the little cap of the Jewish tradition and so forth. So it's all referring to that there's something going on at this level of your consciousness. It is your um, own source to the, it's your it's the um, connection to the source and to the depth of the universe, to your eternal self. And it is a very, very, very important part. So this is really what all spiritual practice is for. This is why all these little deities are sitting here, like pointing upwards, because basically it's saying that at the top of your head, at the crown, there is something waiting for you, which is like the epitome of the human evolution. It is like your complete union with source. So some people that choose to practice deep meditation. As they meditate, it's like the energy goes deeper and deeper and deeper, and at some stage they start feeling very blissful. Everybody's heard that meditation can be blissful. Why is it blissful? Why should we be blissful? Maybe your back is hurting and your knees are hurting. Why are we suddenly feeling blissful? It's because suddenly the energy is traveling back into its source. It's like your consciousness went out on a journey and now finally it's coming back to itself. So it's like consciousness is traveling back home and it just is feeling blissful because you're coming home to your own source. So Sahasrara symbolizes this amazing um, pinnacle of the human uh, potential and it's placed at the air of the top of the head. So when the yogis do crazy things like standing on the head for long periods of time, it's because they really are using their body and their knowledge to bring the energy to the top of the head to kind of expand this level of consciousness. So in the Indian tradition, we have this amazing um, and very depictive kind of analogy because the universe is actually talking to us all the time. In fact, our whole evolution is actually in our energetic blueprint that is through the chakras. So if we get to get the knowledge and we actually adhere to that knowledge and we kind of use it, we can actually kind of reach this amazing potential and maybe some of the experience that some of the other speakers today have, um, have shared with us. So in in India they talk about the lotus flower that has its roots in the muddy waters, so that's the earth, and it pulls it up all the way through its structure and then it comes out into a fragrant flower which is the crown chakra and blossoms into the lotus flower which is often the reference of the crown. So you can see how the universe is kind of talking to us all the time if we have the silence to listen to it and it is the most beautiful experience so I would just uh, invite you to let this be the beginning of your journey of the chakras and uh, hopefully you can uh, take it further and uh, see your full potential of cosmic consciousness um, in this lifetime. Well, thank you.